My Wife's Movie Club watched McClintock. McClintock is a 1963 Western starring John Wayne as George Washington or G.W. McClintock and Maureen O'Hare as his estranged wife, Catherine o. McClintock. I'm not sure everyone would like this movie. Some of the themes and uh, many of the actions that are taken uh, may not translate well into modern society. However, if you look at this film the way it was intended, you may begin to see a very relevant story and a message that applies to any age. The movie takes place in the West, in a territory of the United States, not a state, and it's called the Mesa Verde region. The film starts us off with a group of farmers that have come to the Mesa Verde region. Uh, the government has given several 160 acre plots to a group of farmers. The farmers, or homesteaders, have come on the promise of the free land but they do not understand the conditions there will not support farming. The Mesa Verde region is at an elevation of 6,000 feet, so the government's giveaway will not allow them to farm there. The promises are empty. I'm a clinic. You people plan to homestead and farm the Mesa Verde. Yes, sir. The government give us each 160 acres. The government never gave anybody anything. McClintock warns them right away. Governments are in the business of taking away from people, not giving. A gift from the government is either plunder from someone else or a trap to get you dependent on them, or both, so that you become their servants or slaves. To get gain, you must work for it and earn it. Ultimately, nothing is free. There's always a trade-off. There's no such thing as free land. If you make these homesteads go, you'll have earned every acre of it. But it hates the plow. And even the government should know that you can't farm 6,000 feet above sea level. The government has also put Native Americans, or Indians as they're called in the film, uh, onto a reservation. And I suppose they may have called it free land to them as well. Now they dictate what they can and can't do. Those Indians need my permission to leave the reservation. Those chiefs have been giving orders all their lives. It's pretty hard for them to understand that they have to hold up their hand like a schoolboy in a classroom. Running Buffalo and his tribe have come to McClintock, the city, to welcome other chiefs who have been imprisoned by the government, uh, but uh, they were recently let go. Ironically, the one chief who is not imprisoned by the government has become a prisoner of alcohol. The metaphor is clear. The tribes are losing, losing their sovereignty and are not respected by the government. They are seen as a problem to be controlled. They have been forced to live where they don't want to in a way that is against their nature. They are all prisoners of sorts. The theme is continued throughout the film. The Indian tribes are now being ordered by the government to Oklahoma, to Fort Hill, to make way for these new settlers or farmers that uh, go to the west. And the Indians, believe it or not, do not want to go. The government tells them it will be okay. We'll give you food and clothes and shelter. Uh, this is beyond an insult to them, and they do not want to accept these terms. The government sees them as defiant and places all the chiefs back in a prison. They claim the government is trying to make them into women and children. No slight to women and children here, but culturally, the natives had a system that required some to be cared for and not provide. They had different roles. The honor of manhood lay in the responsibility to provide for those that could not, and by taking this away from them, they were making them into a people who would never have honor again. It was a fate worse than death. Dev, one of the homesteaders who sees farming is not going to work out, realizes he must still make a living, so now he seeks a job. He's not looking for a handout, but we see it is not easy for him to even get a start to earn his living. He goes to GW for a job and is turned down. Why? Because GW has no need for farmers. Dev is persistent and uh, situations do play to his favor, but he feels humiliated at having to ask or beg and receive what he sees now as a handout, the same way the natives feel for being shuffled around. But GW doesn't see it this way. He feels they're trading or making a deal. He's not giving him a handout. I don't know what to say. I never begged before. Turn my stomach. I suppose I should have been grateful you gave me the job. Gave? Boy, you got it all wrong. I don't give jobs, I hire men. You intend to give this man a full day's work, don't you, boy? You mean you're still hiring me, Mr. McClendon? Well, yes, sir. I mean, I'll certainly deliver a fair day's work. 
For that, I'll pay you a fair day's wage. You won't give me anything, and I won't give you anything. We both hold up our heads. McClintock has earned his land, cattle, and mining business by working hard, by playing fair, and through competitive trade. He received no handouts, no stealing, and now he expects the same from those he trades with. It's for the same reason that he's not going to give his empire to his daughter. She will have enough to start a life, but he wants her to work and to make her own life. There is nothing worse than entitlement without accomplishment. McClintock is a movie with a message. The beggar and the thief are both leading lives that lead to loss of liberty, even prison. And even in the territories, our government does not give without cost. The role of government is not to give rights and liberties because they're not theirs to give. It is and only should be to protect our rights. In this part one I let the film McClintock tell us about accountability and responsibility and also a little bit about liberty. In part two I will cover morality and various other lessons from the film. A guard, if you knew anything about Indians, you'd know that they're doing their level best to put up with our so-called benevolent patronage, in spite of the nincompoops that have been put in charge of it.